All right, so we're going to learn about the law of independent assortment and segregation. We're also going to learn about karyotypes and chromosomes. So let's take a look at that. Uh, just remember that these two things are the keys to variety. Um, first thing to remember is one person's DNA sequence is really half from mom and half from dad. Uh, from the female, again, these ovary cells go through meiosis to make egg cells, which have half the um, original amount that that she had in her body cells. So instead of 46, she actually put, puts half, and she puts 23 chromosomes there, haploid. And the guy, too, also, he puts half of his body cells, uh, sorry, half of his um, body chromosome number, and instead of 46, he puts 23 into the sperm, making it haploid also. So when these two haploid cells come together, they make a diploid zygote. And so now you have 46 chromosomes, and that's what you start off uh, with mitosis to, to develop into a, a fully grown human being. Use this uh, for your first drawing. Again, just another uh, example of that. Again, an egg carrying a chromosome and the sperm carrying another chromosome. And they're haploid, one of each, one of each. But when you come together, notice you have two of, two of that kind, so two of each, so that's diploid. So I'm just going to go right into the answer. So somatic body cells are diploid. Gametes, which are sex cells, are haploid. They have half the amount. And they'll have only one of each uh, set. Um, meiosis, meiosis or meiosis creates sex cells. Uh, body cells have 46 chromosomes each, and sex cells have 23, right, half. Fertilization is when sperm and egg combine to create a diploid zygote once again. Half the DNA comes from mom and half from dad. Let's review these terms real quick. Uh, chromosomes, again, let's uh, start with the human being. We're going to zoom into one of our body cells. And here we have the nucleus. And inside the nucleus, there's DNA, right, in the chromosome form. So what is a chromosome? A chromosome is just DNA wrapped around histone proteins uh, tightly so that we can make this chromosome form, which is easy for cell division because it's easier to divide the DNA when it's in chromosome form than to uh, to divide it all spaghetti-like and all disorganized. So it's DNA wrapped around proteins into a chromosome form like that. And then we have um, the DNA, which we are all familiar, the double helix molecule made up of nucleotides. And here are the bases of the nucleotides. There's two bases that connect, A's with T's and G's with C's, as you remember that. And let's look a little more in the DNA. Um, there are pieces of DNA, sections called genes. Each gene will make a protein. So here we have the skin gene, this area over here, this section is called the height gene, and this section is called the eye color gene. So again, what is, what is a gene? So a gene is a section of DNA that has instructions to make a protein. So this one will make this protein. The height gene will make a height protein, and the skin gene will make skin proteins. And so this protein, um, the gene can have two forms. It can make a protein that is a different form, and that'll give a brown eye color. So big B um, will be brown and little b will be green. So alleles are then, again, the different forms of a gene. So you have the eye color gene. What are the two forms? Um, eye color can come in brown or green. So think of it. An easy way to remember that is that genes are very general, but the alleles get into the specifics of the different forms. And then we have homologous chromosomes. They're the same size, shape. They have the same banding patterns. They carry the same genes. And um, so here's one from uh, mom and one from dad. And it, obviously you have homologous chromosomes in a diploid or in a diploid cell, not in a haploid cell. So only in body cells, right? And then here you have a chromosome. Again, a chromosome is made up of chromatids, two chromatids. Remember the, that you had one chrom, uh, one DNA molecule, but then it went through replication to make two identical molecules. So those are two chromatids held together by a centromere. Genes, again, are segments that code for a protein, segments of DNA, and the chromatids are identical DNA copies. Here you have a homologous chromosome. Here's another one. Um, check for understanding. So sections of DNA that have information to create proteins are genes. Uh, two alleles for hair type are uh, wavy hair and curly hair. So again, those are those would be the alleles. And big T's and 
and little t, it still comes out tall because big T is dominant and little t is recessive. The big G and big G is a genotype. Remember, those? that's an allele combination. And it is homozygous dominant. And green eyes is a phenotype because now we're talking about physical appearance. Big G, little g is a genotype, remember. Now, which one is homo homozygous recessive? Homozygous dominant and heterozygous. So this one is homozygous dominant, this one's heterozygous, and this one's homozygous recessive. So the sex chromosomes, uh, let's remember this. Um, so the females are XX and the males are XY. So in your chromosomes, the 23rd pair are your sex chromosomes. They determine your sex, male or female. And what's the probability that two parents will have boys or girls? And it's actually 50-50. You go ahead and uh, do the Punnett square, and you could put the X here and the Y there, the X there and the X there. And it's actually the male that determines the sex of the child. Because if he puts an X, mom's going to put an X anyway, right? And so you get a girl. But if dad puts the Y, then you're going to get a boy. So it's about 50-50 chance to get a boy or a girl. Remember, the X chromosome has a lot of information. It has a lot of genes that are not found on the Y, and that's why a lot of uh, sex-linked uh, traits happen to be on the X chromosome, like color blindness, hemophilia, uh, male pattern, uh, bald, uh, baldness, and other things too. So here's a karyotype. Remember, karyotypes are charts of chromosomes that help scientists or help doctors figure out, you know, pretty much the chromosome health of your child and also to see if it's a boy or girl before any of the genitals are formed. So if you want to know earlier and you don't want to wait too long in your pregnancy to find out, you can do a karyotype, which is done through amniocentesis, which we discussed earlier. And so what you do is you get all the chromosomes and you line them up by tallest pair to shortest pair. So the homologous chromosomes, one from mom, one from dad, and you line them up. Remember that all these, 1 through 22, are called the autosomes. And these, your last pair, uh, 23, are called the sex chromosomes. In this case, you have an X and Y, so this one is a boy, and it's healthy because I can see that all the chromosomes are paired. You know, I don't have one more or one X or one less, so they're all in twos. And so it's a healthy boy. This one's a healthy girl, two X's. And now let's look at this one here. And everything looks fine here. They're all paired. They're all paired except for chromosome 21. And when you have that, that's called the Down syndrome or trisomy 21, which can lead to a lot of um, defects in the child uh, development. So what's the probability of parents having a boy? Again, it's 50-50, right? Males are XX or XY. They're XY, right? A child gets an X from... Actually, this should be like, uh, I should say it's a boy. A uh, boy gets an X from mom and a Y from dad. How are karyotypes helpful? What do they show? Well, they show the sex and the health of your child. What's wrong with this karyotype? Everything looks fine. Pairs, pairs, pairs. But it's only one X. Um, there should be two sex chromosomes, right? Either XX or XY, and there's just only one X. So it has only 45 chromosomes. So that's also called Turner syndrome. Meiosis create variety. Um, again, remember it all happens in the first phase, meiosis one. You have crossing over, the law of independent assortment, and the law of segregation. We can use a diploid cell with just two pairs of chromosomes to illustrate a genetics concept called independent assortment. We will track the movement during meiosis of the cell's two pairs of homologous chromosomes. Before meiosis begins, the cell synthesizes new DNA and thereby replicates each chromosome. Early in meiosis, the pairs associate. Note that the chromosomes in a pair are not quite identical. In one pair, for example, one chromosome carries a recessive allele of a gene, such as a little s, and the other carries a dominant allele, such as a big S. The two pairs line up at the cell's midplane during metaphase 1 and may adopt one of two alternative alignments. The alignments provide the basis for independent assortment. 
the cell may adopt alignment 1, in which the little s and the big y alleles end up in the same daughter cell. Or, the cell may adopt alignment 2, in which the little s and big y alleles end up in separate daughter cells. From a large pool of cells that initiate meiosis, on average, half of them adopt alignment 1 and the other half adopt alignment 2. During the second half of meiosis, the two cells from each alignment divide into four haploid cells. The result is an equal number of the possible genotypes, little s, big Y, big s, little y, little s, little y, and big s, big y. Because there are equal numbers of genotypes, we can say that the alleles of the s and y genes assort independently during meiosis. Note that alleles of different genes always sort independently if the genes reside on different chromosomes, but not necessarily if they reside on the same chromosome. So this is the picture you want to draw um, for standard 8, karyotypes, law of segregation, and independent assortment. For that handout, you want to draw this picture right here uh, at the bottom. So this is a process that makes, again, um, a lot of combinations because they can line up in many ways and so that can explain a lot of things why you and your siblings might be different and why you got something from your dad but your um, your sister got something that's that trait from your mom or something like that so now let's look at uh, again an easy way to do this is instead of following all those steps we do the foil method to predict um, these different combinations that are made of from the law of independent assortment. So, again, when there's two genes, we do the FOIL method. Here there are two genes, and how do I know? It's because there's two letters, R and B. Now, if there's two genes, you know, each gene having two alleles, um, then there's a total of four alleles. Um, but there's two genes, so let's go ahead and do the FOIL method. And following the FOIL method, you uh, can... Do the last segregation and you sec separate R and little r. So little r is going to end up over here. And I can have big R and big B. Remember, I can't have big R and little r because of the last segregation. They must go into opposite cells, those chromosomes, the homologous ones. And then I could also have big R and little b. And those are all the combinations I can have with big R being in front. Then I go to little r. I can have little r and big B. I can also have little r and little b. So little r and little b. And that's how you do the FOIL method. Now I know what the gamete combinations are, or the gamete genotypes. When there's just one gene, you just separate big r and little r. And it doesn't matter. To, you don't have to do the whole FOIL here because even if they line up in a different way, little r would be over here and big r would be over here. It'd still be big R and little r as your combinations. And then remember the last thing that creates variety. We talked about crossing over, law of independent assortment, and then we talked about law of segregation. But don't forget that after the sperm and egg are created, then you have fertilization. You have a sperm with 23 chromosomes uh, from a, a dad. Um, meets with the egg with 23 chromosomes from mom and these two different beings the, the dad and the mom with their different uh, genes they're going to combine and we get a, a new offspring and so that's another process that brings variety the fact that two different organisms are mating bringing their genes into the mix and creating new combinations that weren't aren't there so check for understanding what are the three things that create variety in meiosis um, so again, remember, it's crossing over, law of independent assortment, and law of segregation. After meiosis, what's the next process in sexual reproduction that creates variety? Well, it's fertilization.